Chapter one, uh, exciting uh, chapter as we started off this whole, uh, the beginning of the church through Jesus first ascending into heaven, giving his disciples before he left uh, those last few instructions about waiting in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit that they were going to be baptized in. And uh, as Jesus said, not many days from now, so that was hopeful for them. And he told them to... Uh, to go back to Jerusalem there and wait, and that what would happen is that they were going to receive power when the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them, that they would become these witnesses to Christ, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, the ends of the earth. And then Jesus lifted off the ground and ascended into heaven. Now, I think all of us, especially in America, but around the world, really, uh, we enjoy fireworks, don't we? It's, it's, a, it's a neat thing. It's pretty spectacular. It's stuff blowing up that's not harmful, although it could be, I guess, if it went in the wrong direction. And it's, and it's beautiful to see. Um, and I think to me now, maybe this is more because now that I'm a grandfather and I've, I've, I've raised my own little ones and now I'm having these, this next set, I uh, was able to spend a week with them this last week and it was such a joy. But, but I think the most spectacular for me part of a fireworks show is not the finale where everything kind of gets blown up at once. It's being able to look away from what's glittering in the sky into the eyes of a little one that's seen something like that for the first time. That's amazing. That's spectacular. The, to, and then you kind of get to see it through their eyes. And I can imagine that it was amazing, the sight of watching Jesus ascend into heaven. But I think it would have been spectacular to be able to look into the eyes of the disciples the, that were standing there on the Mount of Olives that day and the look on their face. I think it would have just brought incredible joy to our hearts in, in so many ways. And so it's, uh, it's neat for us to be able to, to study through and, and see the reaction that the apostles had. But with those uplifted eyes that they were told, don't just keep staring up into heaven as the angels joined them there. Uh, you need to go, as you were told, uh, this same Jesus who was taken up will return. He'll be coming back from heaven in this like manner. In the same way that you saw him go into heaven, he will come again. So get on with it, disciples. Go and do what Jesus told you. And so they went, but they never, in a sense, took their eyes away from heaven even though maybe physically they did, but not spiritually and mentally did they, because they went then and gathered in the upper room, and as we saw last time, uh, went into this time of, of prayer and, and really seeking the Lord for what they were to do next. And it's such a neat picture because we were able to see that the church really literally was built on prayer, one of the things that it was. Tonight we're going to see one of the other major things that the church was built on. As the disciples are praying and they're seeking the Lord, not knowing how long it's going to take, but committing to, to remaining in that state of prayer as they went to the temple to praise the Lord, came back to that upper room with all 120 of them, as we learned last week, to pray, to seek the Lord, to set everything else aside to focus on Him, round the clock for 10 solid days. Now, the disciples had known Jesus' exhilarating presence. They had walked with Him, right? And because they had, and because they had listened to His teachings, because they had watched all of His miracles and the ways that He healed and the way that He ministered to people, I'm sure that now, even though they were excited about His ascension, they still felt empty because that presence they were so used to wasn't there. It was gone. And what was so incredible about that for them, little did they know that that emptiness they were feeling was just priming them for this moment of Pentecost that we're going to study about tonight. And remember what Jesus had said himself there when he told his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 5. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am in him bears fruit. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. 
They kept that in mind. That was ringing through their heads as they're now moving forward. Okay, so Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. How is that supposed to work? Because he's not here. And this void that we suddenly feel, how is that going to be filled? Yeah, Jesus had promised that this Holy Spirit was going to come upon us. And earlier in the Gospels that he would teach us the truth and bring us to all knowledge and comfort us. But they hadn't experienced it yet, so they weren't quite sure. They had the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, but had not had the Holy Spirit come upon them yet. So that brings us to chapter 2. Let's read verse 1 together. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So again, we see the apostles, the disciples all together in one accord, in one place, there in the upper room. And it was the day of Pentecost. Now, notice it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. For 1,500 years, Pentecost had come and gone. Pentecost is not something that just happened at the church, the beginning of the church age. Every single year from Passover, you were to count off 50 days after Passover because Pentecost means the 50th. So you were to count off 50 days, and on that day, it was a day after that Sabbath, you were to celebrate this feast that God had ordained. 1,500 years come and gone. It was a normal part of their routine. But now it says Pentecost is fully come. It is about to be fulfilled. The picture that God desired to paint those 1,500 years ago by giving the Israelites the law as they were there in the wilderness at the bottom of Mount Sinai was now going to come to fulfillment on this very day, which is why it had fully come. You see why the Lord puts that there? Now, a Passover almost always occurs right around mid-April, give or take which means that Pentecost usually occurs early in June, 50 days from there. So this was the beginning of their summer. It was one of the best attended of the great feasts because the traveling conditions were most suitable during that time of year. And even for Passover, sometimes could still be part of their rainy season. It was at times difficult for people to travel. And again, just to remind all of us, God's instruction was that for those two times of year, the, in, the, in the fall, the time of the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Booths, those three feasts you were to come to Jerusalem and celebrate. Bring your sacrifices and worship the Lord together. Go back to your homes, winter it out, and then as you start uh, planting and that harvest starts to come in, those first fruits, then you are to come back to Jerusalem Two times, one at Passover and another 50 days later at Pentecost. Now, not everybody could do both. So more often than not, I guess they were as fair-weathered as we can be, they would choose the Pentecost because it was a little more favorable time of year to come to Jerusalem. So all of them were gathered together. There was never a more cosmopolitan gathering in Jerusalem than this time of year. And yet we're going to see how divinely arranged it was that Pentecost itself provides the background for the giving of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because of the feast itself. Now in the Old Testament, Pentecost was part of the feast of first fruits. All right? Those first fruits that you bring in from your fields were to be given to the Lord. And to compare the two, uh, in a sense. Well, l let me read to you Leviticus 23, 17. It gives the instruction about what you are to bring at Pentecost. And you shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah, and they shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. Pay attention to that. And hopefully, if you know enough of your Old Testament history, as soon as you hear that, something inside you should go, wait a minute. With leaven? Wasn't leaven always supposed to be taken out because leaven is a picture of sin? This is the one exception to that where God calls his people to bring the grain 
as a baked loaf and to put leaven into it. To finish off Leviticus 23, 17, it says, they are the first fruits to the Lord. To compare the two, Passover and Pentecost. At Passover, they were to bring a grain offering as well, but it was a loosely tied sheath of grain, whole grain. They were, that was given to the priest, and the priest would wave it over the altar, over the burnt offering. It was a wave offering. That's where that term comes from. But it was, it was this, the grain that, that was not beaten. It was not cooked. It was in its whole form as this, I said, loosely tied together sheep. And the bread that they ate after Passover was unleavened. That was the feast of unleavened bread. So you had Passover where the Passover lamb is sacrificed. And then that very next day began, after that Sabbath, began a seven-day feast of the feast of unleavened bread. So for seven days they ate unleavened bread, commemorative of what God told the Israelites to do when they were there in Egypt, about to be exoduses, exodited, uh, exited <laughs> from Pharaoh's grasp. And they were told, eat bread that does not have leaven, that doesn't rise. It's because you need to understand the urgency here. And what does leaven do? When you put it into flour, it puffs it up, right? It causes, it's like yeast. We used yeast, leaven, it's the same thing. But it causes gas bubbles to form in that dough. And in a sense, it puffs up that dough bigger than it actually is. It kind of gives it a false size. And then you bake that and those air bubbles stay in there, which is why when you slice a piece of leavened bread, you see all those little pockets in there. That's all those pockets of yeast that have caused that gas bubble. It, it puffs it up. So don't put leaven in your bread during the time of Passover. However, Pentecost also had a grain offering, but now, as we just read, this grain was to be bound together in a cohesive or a homogeneous loaf. Do you see the difference? The sheave kind of was this spread out thing, a representation of the nation of Israel. But now God is calling them to take that grain and to bind it together into dough and bake it with leaven into this nice collective loaf. You'll see the picture in just a moment. You see, if you compare the two, Jesus, our Passover lamb, had no sin, right? So that's why there is no leaven in the Passover feast. But Pentecost, all those 1,500 years ago, was going to represent this moment in time, the day that the Holy Spirit would be given and the church literally was birthed. But it was made of a collective loaf, one body, with leaven. Because the church, much to our own chagrin, is still sinful to this day, is it not? Do you see the picture? Passover, no leaven, represented Jesus. Pentecost, with leaven, represents the church, yet both sacrifices accepted by God. Those two loaves that you were to take and wave, God instructed them exactly how to make them. It wasn't against his rule. He accepted it because he was painting that picture all those years before. And notice that they were to bring two wave loaves, two loaves. And it's interesting, maybe not hopefully stretching the uh, typology too much, because one, in a sense, loaf would be for the Jewish people at Pentecost, but there was a second loaf that was reserved for the Gentiles, and that began, if you'll remember, and we're going to study it soon here, at Cornelius' house, when they received as Gentiles the Holy Spirit. So we see this wonderful picture, and that's why Pentecost is just this great background for what's about to happen. Another thing that happened at Pentecost was that it was a celebration of the giving of the law, the anniversary of the giving of the law. And yet here we're going to see that the law, in a sense, was fulfilled by Christ so that from this point on, they were going to go forward. These people that were here, these Jewish believers, remember, they were raised as good Jewish boys and girls. So they knew the law. They followed it as best they could. They had studied the Torah. But now their Jewish faith is going to be replaced by a commitment to Christ. They're that, as I mentioned before, that transition group. And in their commitment to Christ, they were going to see, as they received the Holy Spirit, exactly how 
they were expected to follow Jesus. So they went from the Torah, which was basically Torah-centered and directed, everything the Torah says you do, everything the Torah directs you, you must obey, to now Christ-centered and Spirit-directed. So on the day of Pentecost, which when it had fully come, they were all together in one accord. Now, look what happens in verse 2. First, there was wind. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Remember, the apostles were praying, right? They spent 10 days in prayer. This day of Pentecost for them was no different. Yes, they were mindful of the celebration. Yes, some of them may even have gone to the temple earlier that day to bring their, uh, their obligated sacrifices. But now they're gathered and they're praying like they had every day before since Jesus ascended. Their heads are bowed. They're praying. They're asking for the promise of the Father. They're waiting on the Lord as obediently as they can, as Jesus had instructed them. And all of a sudden, through the open windows of the room, there was this slight sound of a breeze that began to move across. And it didn't take long before that breeze became the roar of a tornado. This great sound that came from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, it mentions a sound. We don't know if it was literal wind or not, but it certainly was the impression of wind. I I don't know if you've ever heard accounts. We have tornadoes, not here in Southern California. We have earthquakes to deal with, and that's plenty fine, thank you. But other parts of our country, a tornado alley, they, they deal with them quite frequently. And I'm sure that all of you have had an opportunity to hear eyewitness accounts of people that have been in tornadoes and storm shelters and those kind of things. And they almost always mention the same thing, that the sound of it it was like a train going right by the house. And it's nothing but wind. (laughs) Nothing but wind. It's a mighty rushing wind that's picking up everything in its path and just ripping through neighborhoods. But they always mention that sound. And, and that's what sticks with them, that, that, that thunder, that roar, like literally a, a giant locomotive that is going right by their own dwelling. That's what the disciples experienced. Now, this word for wind in the Hebrew is ruach, and in Greek it's pneuma, and both of them are used for the Holy Spirit. So this word wind here that is Holy Spirit that's been mentioned before in Acts and will be from this point on uses that exact same word. It's the Ruach, the Hebrew, that was added to the name Abram. Remember, he was Abram at the beginning and there came that point in God's promise where God added that H, Abraham. He added the breath, the Ruach, to Abraham's name. That spirit, if you will. And Abraham was anointed to be the father of many nations, to be obedient. And he was called the friend of God. When Ezekiel had that vision of the valley of dry bones, Ezekiel is instructed by the Lord to prophesy to the Ruach. In Ezekiel 37, verses 9 and 10, listen to what it says. Also he said to me, prophesy to the Breath, the Ruach, prophesy, son of man, and say to that breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, O Ruach, and breathe on these slain, these dry bones, that they may live. So I prophesied and he com- as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. This representation of, of wind, this idea of this, the spirit, which literally took these bones and added sinew and muscle and flesh to it and brought them back to life. In the New Testament, we see Jesus using this example of wind, the, in now Greek, the, the pneuma, where we get the, our idea of pneumatic from, air-driven. And there in John 3, 8, as Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, he says this, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone 
who is born of the Spirit. I, personal thing here, I love the wind. And I think part of it is, is because it always kind of reminds me of these passages that I've studied. And it reminds me of God. It reminds me of His presence. Now, I know it's just an earthly form of it, so I don't worship the wind. Don't worry. <laughs> but I, I enjoy it. I like it. I like a nice breeze. But I also kind of appreciate it when the wind is kind of strong. I lived in Fontana for a number of years, and I learned there about what wind is because it's almost always windy there. And they, when, when we have Santa Ana wind conditions, it was pretty intense there. But I would love to just stand out there in the wind and just, just feel the power of it and, and realize that if it was deciding, if it decided to be strong enough, it could literally pick me up or throw me onto the ground. And, and so you get that idea of the wind, but this, this comparative here of this wind coming into the upper room and really, it's speaking about the Holy Spirit was about to now come upon the people in this room. It was sort of like that shot across the bow. It was the, the warning, the sound. Here it comes. Here comes the Lord. And so often before a storm, you know, you, if you can kind of read the weather a little bit, a lot of times there's a good wind that comes, gets pushed ahead of it, isn't there? And then that storm comes. It was the same kind of thing. This wind is a warning. The Holy Spirit is coming. And as a matter of fact, he comes from heaven. He, the Holy Spirit, like the wind, will fill the whole world. He moves at will, like the wind, cannot be cornered or contained. We try to harness the wind, right, with turbines and fans and things like that. But we can't contain it or corner it or tell it where to go. It comes and goes. That's why Jesus used that example. It comes and goes as it pleases. So they're sitting there, and suddenly this, this rushing wind, this sound, that was not just within their hearts. This was audible. This was thundering through. Well, first the wind, that was the sound, and then came the sight, fire. Look at verse 3. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them. I want you to notice before we get into fire a little bit, the order. First sound, then sight. That's significant. God is setting up, in a sense, an order for the church. First sound. How is it we come to faith? By what? The hearing of the word, right? By the truth of God being spoken to our hearts and minds that illuminates then our lives to our need for God. So it's the sound, the hearing of the word that comes first. Then comes sight. Those signs and wonders that we see that accompany his word. Or that great day in that moment when we'll see him face to face. But we need to have faith in what, from what we hear about God's word. Not necessarily by what we see. See, we'd love to flip it around the other way. We'd like to see God first and then he can talk to us all he wants. Because we've already seen him. But that doesn't take much faith. There's a few songs that we sing right now that I really appreciate. I think one of them is I Will Rise. I can't remember the exact line right now, but, but Chris Tomlin basically says, oh, when my, when my faith turns into sight. In other words, when I get to heaven, faith will no longer be necessary because I will see. I will see Christ for who he is. I'll see Jesus face to face. So that order is important. But now God, along with the warning of the wind, here comes the Spirit, now gives this tangible example that everyone in that room would understand. Because fire is a symbol, is one of the symbols of God's presence throughout the whole Bible. Do you remember Moses as he was out there with those goats up on the mountainside? And he suddenly looks over and he sees a bush that's burning but is not consumed. Exodus 3, 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And so he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. God represented by that fire. Later on in Exodus, as the Israelites are there at the bottom of Mount Sinai, in Exodus 24, 17, it says, The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. 
So for them, there was, has always been this connection with fire, representing God's presence. Do you remember as the Israelites were being led through the wilderness? It was a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day, but a pillar of what by night? Fire that illuminated their way, that literally shone throughout the entire camp. Anybody could step out of their tent at night, look toward the middle of camp where the tabernacle was, and see that pillar of fire hovering right over the holy place, the holy of holies. So they understood the connection of God being represented by fire. See, up to this point, God's presence on Israel demonstrated a corporate unity. It was a single fire, right? A single fire that was there on the top of the mountain. A single fire that was that pillar that lighted their way. But notice what happens now. God now takes that single fire and he divides it up into separate little flames. And now instead of a corporate unit of a nation, that presence now hovers over the top of each individual disciple that's in that room that day. He took his presence and the symbol of it and he split it up. He fractured it in a sense to all the people that were gathered there. The spirit now rests on each believer individually. That was a huge change. The people of Israel, the Jews, understood God's presence. They understood the Shekinah glory. They understood the anointing, which was on one person at one time for a very particular purpose. But God was changing that because His Son had done what He was supposed to do. He had died and given His life for the sins of mankind. He had conquered death by raising from the dead and being the first fruits of resurrection. Now he was ascended and he was at the right hand of the Father. So now, rather than dwelling with one person at a time in his human form, he was able to now dwell with all of mankind at once. And that was the, the, the message that was being given here by these tongues of fire that sat upon each of them. God was giving that to each individual believer. And fire is interesting, isn't it? isn't it? Because it has different aspects or properties to it. For one thing, fire burns, right? So within that, we see judgment. It has an element of judgment to it. When my daughter was very young, two or three years old, we were at Chili's as a, as a family one day, and they brought a, we ordered fajitas, and they brought the fajita plate and sat it in the middle of the table. And we said, Sophie... Don't touch, it's hot. And the very next sound we hear is sizzling and screaming. <laughs> she had to do it. She had to find out for herself that that cast iron thing they had just set on the table was very, very hot. She was judged <laughs> by the burning. Fire has that element. It burns, it judges, right? Does it not indeed separate those that believe in God from those that don't, that element of fire. But even for the believer, fire purges, doesn't it? When they want to purify something, they use fire. They use heat. They make it molten. But then beyond that, they heat it up even more to separate the dross, the impurities from that metal or whatever it is that they want. Fire has that way of purging things from our lives that don't belong. What else does fire do? It illuminates, doesn't it? It lights stuff up. For us as Christians, basically it shows us that way to God's will. It shows us the path to take that he wants us to walk. Your word is what? A lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A lamp to my feet so when I look down, I won't stumble on anything. But it's also a light to my path so when I look ahead, I know where I'm supposed to walk. Fire illuminates. But fire also warms. That's the part of fire we all like, right? When it's cold, if you're out camping, you put on a fire, what, is, what naturally happens? Everybody sits around it and sucks in smoke for the next hour. Why is it I always end up sitting right where the smoke comes? I've done this before. It's something about it's mosquitoes and fire, two things that some are, for some reason are, I'm a, are attracted to me. I'll move around the firing and just literally watch the smoke follow me for some reason. 
And yet we love it, don't we? That glow of the fire, it, it brings great memories. And we have times of sharing and singing songs, worshiping the Lord around a campfire, around a fire. Fire warms. It draws us close to Him. It also has an effect on the world, right? It, it, wants, it gets the world to want to come in and experience that. And another thing that fire does is it smolders. Even when you think a fire is out, it's not. Even when it begins to ebb, it really never goes out. Well, it eventually will, but the Holy Spirit doesn't. Even when the Holy Spirit seems to be dim in our lives, it's still there. It's still smoldering, just waiting for us to say, Lord, I can't do this. I need your help. Oh, poof, here comes another flame ready to do all of those other things, burn and purge and illuminate and warm. Notice that all of them partook. These symbolic flames embraced them equally, both the humble and the unknown, the unnamed. It wasn't just Peter and the gang. Every single one of them in that room, a fire danced on their heads. God was telling them, this is for everyone individually. And then verse 4, and they were all filled, all, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled and they immediately began to witness. What a beautiful picture. Now, it simply says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean when someone is filled, when a believer is filled with the Holy Spirit? Paul gives us some insight. And I would like to take a moment and have all of us turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 for just a moment, beginning in verse 18. Just turn there. It's a few books to your right. Ephesians 5 beginning at verse 18. Paul here gives us some insight about the result or what happens when someone is filled with the Holy Spirit. First of all, he says, verse 18, and do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, what, what Paul is doing is he's giving a comparative here. Being drunk with, a wine, with wine is something that comes and goes, Right? You have to drink a lot of it in order to get intoxicated, but if you stop drinking, which hopefully you do at some point, eventually that will wear off. That's dissipation. And not only that, but it's, it's foolish. It's, it's giving your body over to have something control it that's ungodly. However, he says, be filled, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then there's a comma there. And he now is going to give us a list of the things that someone filled with the Holy Spirit will naturally do. What is the very first thing? It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So one of the first results of being filled with the Spirit is communication. When we're filled with the Spirit, we no longer want to have conversation about the, uh, about the things of the world. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we want all of our conversation to be about the things of the Lord. Isn't it a blessing to be able to get together with a brother or sister and just talk about God and the stuff He's doing in your life and the things that He has done and the things that you're learning through His Word and, and the stuff that the Lord's ministering to you and the opportunities you've had to minister to others? It's exhilarating. That's why we have fellowship. That's why we're called to come together to be able to share with one another those things that God has done in our lives. So we speak to one another. We have this communication, godly communication, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's, it's that whole idea of being God-centered in every way. So the first thing in being filled with the Spirit is our communication. The next thing that we notice is that we have great joy. What does it say? Singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. When you're filled with the Spirit, you can't help but just bubble over with exuberation of who God is and making this melody in your heart to the Lord. I, I love that. Have you ever caught yourself singing to God just on your own, maybe in the shower, maybe in the car, you know, and without even realizing it, just a song might be running through your head that we've done in worship or that you've heard on the radio or played at home. And it's that chorus. It just kind of gets stuck in there, which is a good thing now because it's something of the Lord. And you just find yourself humming it. And before you know it, you're just, you find this, this connection with God. You know that He's pleased about what you're singing to Him, making, singing and making these melodies in your heart 
to the Lord. This great joy, the inner music of our souls goes right up to God in every way. Another thing being filled with the Holy Spirit does is it gives us thanksgiving. Verse 20 there. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks always for all things. Think about that for a minute. Let me ask you this. Is giving thanks for all, always for all things possible without God? I'd like to see you try. Now, notice it says giving thanks in all things, right? It, it, it's that whole idea of no matter what comes our way, God gives us the supernatural ability, supernatural, not natural, ability to be thankful even in the midst of the greatest trials. That's another part of being filled with the Spirit. Without the Lord, we can't possibly give thanks in everything because it literally is a supernatural action in our lives. And that's why it's evidence of us being filled, literally filled with the Spirit. And then finally, verse 21, another thing that when we're filled with the Spirit is we are in subjection or submitting to one another in the fear of God. This is another thing that doesn't happen naturally, does it? As a matter of fact, a lot of us have to fight it even spiritually. When we, when we are around our brothers and sisters, we're still those little jealousies that can come up. There's still those little envies here and there. Oh, he's so gifted. Oh, she's so talented. Oh, she witnesses so easily. She can just be out there on the street and just share her faith. And, and he can pray with people on the spot. And we get that little bit of, oh, if only I could. We have to fight that. Because it says here that we're submitting to one another in the fear of God. We're willing to be subjected literally to one another. And this certainly wasn't the apostolic disposition up to this point. We've talked about that before, right? These guys argued all the time. But now, as it says right there in chapter 2, verse 1, you can go ahead and go back to Acts chapter 2. It says there that they were in one accord. I know we joked about that last week, about them driving a Honda in case you weren't here. But being of one accord means they were, they were like-minded in everything. They, there was no uh, disputing whatsoever, no jealousies, nothing that came between them. Certainly the benefits of this one-time Pentecostal filling, as we're seeing here in verses 1 through 4, the benefits of it still remain to this day. Because if we're filled with the Spirit, we'll have that communicative spirit of wanting to speak the things of the Lord. We'll have that joyful spirit, that thankful spirit, that yielding and serving spirit. As God fills us, it becomes that evidence that we are filled. And here in verse 4, we see the disciples there in the upper room. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what is the result? They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So... In verse 5, we see the crowd that was invited that day. It says in verse 5, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, notice it wasn't just the disciples that heard it, but it was heard through the city. When the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak, the disciples speak, in his own language. You see, Jews coming, devout men from every nation under heaven. By the time of Christ, the Jews of the dispersion, the Jews had been dispersed on several occasions. The northern kingdom had been taken by the Assyrians and really never relocated. Some of them did. Many of them as half-breeds, as it were, came back. They were known as the Samaritans. A lot of those in the north, the Galileans, as we'll see in a minute, came from that. But then the Judah, people of Judah and Benjamin also were taken to Babylon, and many of them did not come back. So from that point until the day of Christ, the Jewish people literally spread to the four corners of the known world at that time. And they, interestingly enough, controlled a significant, unofficial commercial empire. They were always very thrifty, very good with money, great merchants, and had developed this, in a sense, this commercial empire sort of 
under the radar in all of these different places. So these men who were still devout, I mean, they, they loved God, they worshipped Him, they studied the Torah. As a matter of fact, in any one of those outlying cities, as long as there were ten men in a given city, they had a quorum of ten, they could establish a synagogue, and they did. Which is why when we'll see later on Paul going to so many of these Gentile towns, there were synagogues there that he would always minister in first, The reason being is because they had been established all those years before by these diaspora Jews, these Jews of the dispersion as they were. And when they came together to meet in the synagogue, study the Torah, gather to worship, they also made a sharp distinction between themselves and the Gentiles of those cities that they lived in. But these devout men found their way to Jerusalem for the feast. And now we see them here from so many different nations being amazed. But God was the one that did this. He picked this day because he had assembled a great multilingual Jewish congregation. They still spoke Hebrew and read it. Most of them probably read and understood Aramaic. But they also spoke the language of whatever country or area or dialect that they were from. And so they're amazed not just by the sound but by this incredible phenomenon that they see before them as they see these individuals they could pick out of the crowd, not somebody here close to them, but standing way over there, someone speaking my language. And you know, people that can speak a foreign language, I speak Dutch, they love to hear that language. If, if it's part of your heritage, there's that instant connection. And, and, and there's this, this, just that, that affection and, and affinity to that. They, they, they love to hear their own language spoken by others. God's rushing wind had brought the crowd. It got their attention. But the apostles now step out from the upper room, as we see there in, in verse 6, and begin to now proclaim the works of God in the courtyards and streets around the upper room in the languages of the day. Now, there in verse 6 where it says, confused, they were confused because everyone heard them speaking in their own language. That word language is dialectos. And it literally means language or dialect of some country or district. So when God gave this gift of tongues to the disciples on that day, it was for a very specific purpose. It wasn't just jabbering. It was distinct languages being spoken. Very, very accurately. Everyone standing there heard their own native dialect spoken with flawless grammar, pronunciation, and even the local idioms that they were familiar with. But here's the part that was even more amazing to them. Verse 7. Yet they, and then, they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Now, (laughs) it's almost a little bit of a jab, isn't it? It was amazing that they heard this sound. It gathered them to this place. Where is that coming from? We need to find out. And we'll find out later as, as, as Peter begins to speak and the Holy Spirit falls upon and converts. There were at least 3,000, probably more there that were, that, that, that were at that gathering in that place. They were drawn by that. But then when they get there, they hear the mighty works of God being proclaimed by Galileans in their own language? How is that possible? Because the Galileans were an ignorant despised, they were country bumpkins, basically, up there from the north. And and as a matter of fact, they all have this really funny accent because they can't pronounce the gutturals. That word we used earlier, the ruach, that sound, not everybody can do that. Well, the Galileans couldn't. So you can imagine, and there's a lot of chuch in in Hebrew, lochaim. How do you say lochaim when you can't do that sound, lochaim? So they were instantly recognized, the Galileans, because of that quirky accent that they had. And now not only can they not speak good Hebrew, but they are suddenly these amazing linguists <laughs> who are speaking in not just languages, but dialects. 
I, I don't know if you are familiar, but many, many countries that have a given language also have dialects within that language. You know, we, we're familiar with Spanish, but so many other countries have dialects of Spanish. Cuban, for example, if you hear Cuban spoken and you understand Spanish, you can probably get a lot of it, but there's going to be parts you don't because it's a dialect. And so the disciples were speaking not only in these individual languages, but even the specific dialects. It absolutely amazed the people that were there. They were hearing their own language. And then in verses 9 through 11, we get this quick little geography lesson. And can we go ahead and put the map up? As we read through this, we can, you'll, you'll see some of the names, but I'll, I'll point them out in a minute. Verse 9, we'll just read through it first. Uh, who were there? Uh, Parthians and Medes and uh, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judah and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. And what did they say? We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Do you see what the Lord's doing here? He's, he's doing this amazing, he's filling his disciples with this power. And within seconds, within moments, he's dispersing that out now as his disciples begin to minister. And he's drawing people in from all the corners of the world. I mean, look at the, the Pathian Empire was over on this side. So that would be the eastern kind of boundary of the world. Media, Elam is over here. Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, all the way down here from Arabia. As south, the top, top part of Africa, Libya, Egypt, Judea, but then even as far west as Rome, coming back in here to Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, they're all mentioned here. And all of them from all of those places, even Crete, making their way to Jerusalem because of this feast. By coincidence? What a coinky dink. God just happened to have everybody there at the right time, didn't he? They're all gathered together. They're all in one place. And the languages and dialects of Asia, Africa, and Europe were instantly recognized. You see, the sound of the mighty wind drew the people, but it was the praise of the believers that captured their hearts. It got their attention. And if you think about it, it's kind of interesting. This is kind of a reversal of the judgment that God placed on the Tower of Babel. Now you're going to think to yourself for a minute, no, Gerard's now lost his mind. What? What happened at Babel? Everyone spoke the same language, right? And they decided that they were going to build this tower to reach into heavens, to reach up to God, to maybe become gods themselves. And what did God do to judge them? He confounded their languages. He gave them all different tongues so that they could not understand each other, and it dispersed them. That was the judgment that happened then. What's God doing now? He's reversing it, isn't it? He's bringing all of that back together now under the, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and now having his disciples speak all of those languages coming from one place to the amazement of everyone standing there. The judgment was over. It's time to bring all of that back together. What was the language that was being spoken that day? It was the language of the gospel. It was the good news of Christ. It was the wonderful works of God. And then in closing for today, here in verses uh, 12 and 13. Oops. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, "Ah, they are full of new wine." You know, when you have a mixed crowd, you're always going to have a mixed reaction, aren't you? And unfortunately for some, they made the fatal mistake. And what was their mistake? They attributed the supernatural to the natural. Something God was supernaturally doing, taking these ignorant country bumpkins, these these Galileans, rather, up there in the north that couldn't even pronounce Hebrew correctly, and speaking with great accuracy 
the languages of all those standing there. That was supernatural by the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And they just wrote it off to, yeah, it's new wine. Really? The last time I've ever saw someone drunk being able to even speak his own language, let alone fluently another language that he's never spoken before, it has yet to happen in my experience. And yet, because they didn't want to face the possibility that God was doing something incredible here, they just wrote it off. And it was a fatal mistake for them because they walked away to their own self-sufficient life. Others, however, were amazed. And this word here, amazed and perplexed, that phrase really, in a sense, de de depicts them being literally distraught. It was like they were beside themselves. They couldn't even catch their breath. They were just so taken in. They were literally dumbfounded. They were speechless, amazed and perplexed by what this was. And all they could do was ask a question, whatever could this mean? And it leaves us today with that same question. What does it mean? Well, it means that the Holy Spirit, first of all, brings new life to those who believe in Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. The Holy Spirit with, then, drawing all of us as He did in to a knowledge of God and awareness of our own sin and a need for a Savior. But it also means a fire that burns away the chaff of our lives as God takes us in as His own and begins to systematically purge and purify us. What else does it mean? It means that the truth of God was going out from His disciples as it goes out from us. And we're, when, when we're willing to have the Holy Spirit fill us, come upon us, we'll be able to share that truth in ways that you could have never dreamed possible. I've experienced that, and I know you have too. Those moments when you just know the Holy Spirit is taking over. You just know, ah, this isn't me. And you get to literally ride that wave. There's that inner smile, maybe even a literal smile on your face because you know, this is God. What I'm sharing right here to my, my family member that I've been praying for for so long or, or that coworker that I've been just so longing to, to be able to tell the truth because they've gotten that bad news about that terminal illness they're dealing with. I can't wait another second. I, this needs to happen now. And you finally step out in faith and you break that barrier and you say, I'm going for it. And you start to speak those words and, and it begins with those, those verses you know or those thoughts you have and before you know it, it's like it's just the Lord's taken over and you're just, it's just flowing from you. There's nothing like it. That's what it means. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It means speaking the truths of God. Let me put it to you in, its, in a sense its simplest terms. Being, the Holy Spirit being with us, that's foregone conclusion, right? That's for the world. But for us, we have the Holy Spirit in us, and we have the Holy Spirit upon us. Think of it this way. The Holy Spirit in us is for us, right? The Holy Spirit convicts my heart. The Holy Spirit draws me to God. The Holy Spirit illuminates my life. The Holy Spirit directs me as to where I am to go. So the Holy Spirit in me is for us. The Holy Spirit upon us is for others. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, He gives us the boldness. He gives us the words. He gives us the, the, the faith to walk forward and minister God's love to everyone else. And all we need to do for that is to be empty. Right? Empty of self empty of our own agenda, our preconceived notions, and filled with the Spirit, acknowledging that we need Christ. Because I can guarantee you that each time we acknowledge our inadequacy honestly to God, He fills us with more of His Spirit so that we can carry on the work. I know it. And I know many of you do too because you've walked that. Jesus said himself, Matthew 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Empty of self, filled with him. 
and he'll be there. Let's pray. Ah, Lord Jesus, again, what an amazing passage of seeing your love for this small group of people that would not only have this symbol of fire upon them on this day, but literally become a fire that would blaze through first the nation of Israel and then beyond to the known world, turning it right side up once again and having you as the center of all things for them. By your Spirit, the disciples had felt the emptiness inside of having Jesus gone, his physical body ascended into heaven. But now they once again understood and knew your desire was to replace that by filling their very hearts with your presence, with your spirit, with your power, with your love. Tonight as we conclude and we'll have some of our guys up here. If you want to know what it is to have the Holy Spirit come upon you, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you've never really surrendered that to God, I'd encourage you to, uh, to come up afterwards and have one of our guys pray for you. I know that it would be a blessing to your life and that you would be able to go from here in this moment with the confidence of knowing the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And again, baptism is, is for the moment to, to give you that confidence, but we can ask daily and even moment by moment to have God fill us with His Spirit. But I'd encourage you, let that be a line of demarcation for you here tonight to come up and, and get prayed for with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that those spiritual gifts that Paul talks about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 would be manifest in your life in some way. And, and realize that even though here in this upper room, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit was that these disciples spoke in tongues and languages and different dialects, that is not a direct manifestation or a requirement of the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a firm conviction for all of us on the pastoral staff that everyone should be able to speak in tongues, especially that heavenly language that Paul will later talk about. But to be baptized in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit can manifest Himself any way He chooses. In your life. Be obedient to that and don't hesitate to come up and have one of our guys pray with you. Let's go ahead and stand together and sing this last.